So I want to talk about health reform and health policy for a little bit. That's a topic that I do a lot of research and writing on. It's a topic I do a lot of teaching on uh, with undergraduates and with graduate students. We have a couple minutes together, and so unfortunately we have to focus. I'm very sorry. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on even this morning in health policy that we could talk about. Um, but uh, okay, we'll go. But we'll stick with the planned program and not diverge into all of that. Boy, what a lot of things we could talk about. So I figured. I figured I would tell you two sort of stories, uh, and that would lead to a little bit of a policy proposal that floats around. Some of you may have seen this one. It's a little below the radar in a lot of ways, but maybe an up-and-comer that you can keep your eyes on for the next round of debates and discussions we're going to almost surely have, because we still have to get a, a better handle on the healthcare spending that we have in this country. So my stories uh, and my, my policy discussion a little bit has to do with employer-provided health insurance, insurance that workers get from the company that they work for, from their job. First bit, why do we even have this, and where did it come from? Turns out, to get a handle on this, you've got to go back a little ways. We've got to go back to the 1940s, when, among all the other things going on in the world, partly because of all the other things going on in the world, there was a big labor shortage in the United States. There weren't enough workers to satisfy the demand for labor from the companies that wanted to hire them. And in an economics 101 sort of way, wages started to go up. People started to get paid more for their jobs, actually quite a bit. This led to increases in prices for goods and services, products that people were buying, which tended to annoy a bunch of folks. And there's a long story about that. Consumers, government, lots of people. But eventually, the government decided, decided uh, we're going to do something about this. So not that easy to do something about it, but sometimes when you have a public policy problem, you can just whack it with a giant sledgehammer. So what they tried to do was uh, whack it with a giant sledgehammer, passed a law, it uh, came to be called the 1942 Stabilization Act. The law said, we're going to keep wages right where they are, I mean, give or take, uh, but no raise in wages. Very interesting, lots of controversy, but a lot of people were sort of patriotic and went along with the idea, and it kind of worked. Up to a point, at least, it slowed the growth in wages and it slowed the growth in prices. But it couldn't totally work. Uh, because it didn't address the underlying problem. There still weren't enough workers to go work for the companies that wanted to hire them. And so people trying to hire had to come up with another way to get folks to come to work for them. What did they do? They said, that law has nothing to do with health insurance, so why don't we give workers health insurance as an additional inducement to come work for us? Totally cool, very interesting, but created, in some sense, the momentum toward employer-provided health insurance in America today. Another thing also happened, which nobody noticed at the time, but has actually been perhaps the biggest driver of it right now, which was there was some controversy, right? Not everybody is happy about a wage ceiling being put on workers. Uh, and so there was some debate. So one way to make people happier, they said, well, we, can, we know you're going to get some of this, um, this health insurance from your employer. Let's just make it tax-free. You can get that as a form of compensation and not pay income taxes and not pay Social Security taxes on that, on that benefit at all. Nice for the workers. Everybody kind of liked that, which made it a lot easier to swallow the wage and price controls that were being put on to keep prices from going up. Two remarkable things that happened actually just as part of the course of business at the time that have enormously shaped our health insurance system right now. They made tremendous difference in where people got their health insurance. In 1940, 9% of Americans had private health insurance. Almost none of them got it from their job. 1953, 60-some percent of Americans have health insurance. Almost all of them get it from their job. Remarkable transformation over a little more than a decade of time. By the 70s, it's about 70% of Americans that have health insurance from their job. And come to today, it still shapes the world in which we live today. 50% of Americans get health insurance from employers for reasons nobody ever sat down and thought about. Nobody did on purpose. Nobody said, this is a really good idea. Let's do it this way. It just happened because of the way the 1940s played out and the aftermath of it. It's really interesting today because it has big implications for the ways that our healthcare system functions right now. So here's my little second uh, kind of anecdote to lead us up to a policy proposal. It's what happened when people started to get health insurance, private health insurance, without going through their employer, getting it on their own. 
And we've got a big experiment, or a big set of experiments over the last few years with the Affordable Care Act that was put in place in 2010, started to sell insurance to people in state marketplaces in 2014, and now we've had two or three years or four, uh, well, three really, of experience selling this insurance. What's happening in these marketplaces, like Covered California, uh, is people go shop for health insurance. They see different plans that they can buy. They see different prices that they might pay. As you've all read the paper, some of that's a little bumpy. Uh, some of it works okay in some places, and some of it hasn't worked perfectly over time. But the shopping experience is really interesting for health insurance, because it's really the first time we've done this in a big way. In Southern California, a bunch of the health insurance plans said, We're gonna, we know people are going to shop uh, on the web. They're going to see the prices of our, our policies, and they're going to see some characteristics of our policies. We want to think about this a little differently, they said. Uh, and they started looking around for ways to make their health insurance premiums a little lower. And they started talking especially about which doctors and hospitals were going to be in the networks in their plans. And all of them found this hospital, maybe you've heard of it, Cedar sinai Medical Center, big hospital in Southern California, the hospital of the stars. If you're a, a movie star and you're going to get a procedure, actually the odds are pretty good you're going to get it at Cedar sinai uh, Very well-known, high-quality hospital. Also not a cheap hospital. Uh, depending on the study that you want to look at or the data, it might be among the, the country's most expensive hospitals. Before the Affordable Care Act marketplaces, Cedar sinai is in the network for just about every health plan offered in Southern California. The first year that health plans came out on the Covered California Exchange and people were shopping, Cedar sinai was in the network for zero of them. It was dropped from every single plan because it was expensive. That created a really interesting discussion, right? Because it's a good hospital, people like it. So there was then, then ensued a conversation about whether Cedar sinai ought to be in the network. Some health plans decided eventually to put it back because people said we want it. But it raised their premiums, and it created a discussion really for the first time in this sort of meaningful way about how much are we willing to pay for a hospital like Cedar sinai Who's willing to pay more, and are some people willing to pay less? Can you find another hospital to substitute for that that's less expensive? Can we make something interesting happen in our healthcare system, because of this kind of shopping that goes on, can we create a new dialogue around what we're willing to pay for and who we're willing to pay to do it? That was a remarkable moment for me, because for years and years of employer-provided health insurance, and despite the efforts of many employers who have tried very hard to have these conversations to work at this, it's been very hard to have a conversation in that way. But once we got people shopping, even in a small way, even in the very bumpy way that wasn't necessarily working out in every case, it created a remarkable dynamic and it's an astonishing opportunity for conversation about how we're gonna manage our healthcare spending. Okay, so where do I get back to at the end of the day? Here's something that's been floating around in the healthcare discussion over time, and it's this, we should get rid of the tax exclusion for health employer provided health insurance. Why do we still have people getting insurance from their employers? Because we give it to them tax-free. Maybe we should change that. You can decide whether you like this or not. It would probably have important implications for healthcare in America. A lot of employers would decide eventually not to offer health insurance. People would go shopping, and as long as there was some place like the marketplace, like Covered California, they would create a new dynamic for discussions about costs and quality in healthcare in America might have other good things that would go with it, right? It would save a certain amount of, would give the Treasury in, in the Washington a certain amount of money, you could like that or not. It would dis decouple your health insurance from your job, which might make it easier for people to change jobs, start new businesses, things like that. It's possible that this would even uh, have some political support. Republicans and Democrats have proposed this at different times, often not in major ways, but it comes up in the Bush administration, comes up in the Obama administration. So it's possible that you'd get some sort of uh, discussion of this in Washington. It would not be popular, uh, unfortunately. It would not be popular. It would be a tax increase of some kind. Now, I could, we could have a longer discussion. Maybe I could manipulate it so you'd get some of that money back in other ways, but it would definitely disrupt some of the discussions of, or some of the status quo, and there would be discussions about that. We can learn a little, because in the last few years, there's been this thing in place called the Cadillac tax. Some of you that are into health policy will, will know about the Cadillac tax. It's a teeny tiny attempt to start to do this that was part of the Affordable Care Act. And I'll tell you, the Cadillac tax has been subject to intense lobbying uh, by a lot of folks who want to get rid of it. 
But it has also been the subject of intense interest from employers who are very concerned about uh, how they will change their health benefits offerings going forward. So that I'm going to end. I'm just about out of time. I don't know whether you like it or not. I don't know whether it'll come to anything or not, but keep your eye on it. This is an idea that's been floating around. It's one that'll probably come back. We're gonna talk about single payer. We're gonna talk about other kinds of reforms, but we're gonna talk about a bunch of other options in there too, and this just might be one of them, and maybe now you can uh, keep track of it and watch it as it comes out.